I wish I would have kept a journal, honestly. Me too. You know, when I first became Muslim, mm -hmm. because I'm sure there's a lot of things that I forgot. You know, yeah. just because when you're when you, um, it's so hard to. Uh, it, it's like uh, it's like literally, it's like being born. You know, so you don't see things the same. Sometimes I wish, like people ask me questions and they and I, I wish I could remember what it felt like mm -hmm. to not be Muslim. And I've been Muslim for so long, I don't remember. Like I work in a company where it's all Americans and whatever. And honestly, I hear they talk about like going to the bar and going to disco, whatever. And I remember a time when I was doing that, but it, I, it's been so long that I don't remember what was pleasurable about that. Like now when I hear them, I just feel sorry for them. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you do that? It's so stupid. I was born and raised in Southern California, in Long Beach, uh, which is the South Bay. Um, it's pretty close to the ocean, so it's a um, not a stereotypical Southern California community, but it's probably, it's not Beverly Hills 90210, but it's, it's, you know, I guess compared to most places in the world, it's fairly upscale. And we lived um, for, we lived in different areas, but you know, in my childhood, we lived in a fairly white affluent um, area of Long Beach, California. Um, I, I, I was raised, um, you know, with, it's a very diverse community. So you are exposed to all different points of view. You know, my parents were um, hippies in the 1960s, so they um, they had all you know they were all over the place as far as philosophy, religion, etc. Um, my dad had um, influences of Buddhism and Christianity and everything, and my mom um, was uh, raised a Christian, a very devout Christian actually in the Lutheran Church, but she sort of um, not really went away from it. The fundamentals were still there, but she wasn't an active Christian, but like we were raised by our grandparents. I guess I wasn't the typical um, child in the sense that I was always intellectually curious. Um, I was never satisfied with just going to church. And um, you know, the typical Christian scenario is you go to church on Sunday, um, you know, you commit sins the rest of the week, do whatever you want, and then you just repent on Sunday. I, I mean, I was never satisfied. I always saw that as being hypocritical, and it was not very satisfying, etc. So I was always questioning the theology of Christianity, um, why they believe in this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I, I never was just satisfied with people saying believe and, you know, just accept it. Um, like my brother, I would get in arguments with my pastor. I mean, literally, he would kick me out of his office too. Like we would question because they don't they don't welcome um, they don't welcome deep theological questions because they're not stupid. They understand the problems in their theology just as well as I did, and they don't have very good answers a lot of the time. Um, they tend to focus on the community and the goodwill and charity and you know. Being, doing good to your fellow man, etc., which is great. I mean, I'm all for that, and I, I was very happy that they did do that. But um, at some point, it's like eating junk food. You know, you want something more substantial, something more spiritually nourishing, etc. So I would continuously ask questions, um, and I wouldn't get very satisfying answers. So as a result of that, I started doing a lot of my own research. They couldn't comprehend why I would even care. Like, all of them were Christian because their parents were Christian. I mean, frankly, if you ask them, that's why they're Christian. Unfortunately, like why most Muslims are Muslim. <laughs> I know I'm skipping ahead, but most people in general tend to, like the Quran says, we found our fathers following this religion, so we're following in their footsteps. So most people in general are like that, including Christians. And so most of them didn't think that deeply about it and didn't care that much about it. Um, they like my brother was mentioning, went through confirmation class, which was kind of the genesis. They just w saw that this as a class they had to take and pass the test and get through it so they could be considered a member of the church and they could take communion. Um, I didn't see it that way. I saw it as an experience to really delve deeply into the philosophical, theological underpinnings of the church. But I was pretty much, me and my brother were the only people that saw that <laughs> Nobody else did. They're just like, okay, when's the final exam? What do we need to study? You know, that's how they thought of it. So um, 
the, but the pastor, he was frustrated with us. So he communicated that frustration. My grandfather was frustrated because I would ask him, you know, like he was telling you, you know, I would look at the Bible and I would say, okay, this is the Gospel of John. And then I would look in the notes in the Bible and I would say, the author, anonymous. And I would say, okay, to my grandpa. Too. So they call it the Gospel of John. Did John write it? And he would say, yeah, John write it, wrote it. And I said, oh, so the apostle, yeah, I don't know if you, how much you know about Christianity. So I would say, you mean the disciple of Jesus, John? And he would say, um, well, we're not really sure. Somebody named John probably wrote <laughs> it. So I would start asking these kind of questions. And, you know, I would get very either unsatisfactory answers or they people they just didn't know and they would try to hide their own ignorance by you know making up an answer etc so i was never satisfied with that so i would do my own research i couldn't find it so my brother was telling the story but i'll you know I'll retell it it's basically the same story about um you know we were taught there were several classes in our church about islam and they were of course very negative and this is a cult and etc cetera, et cetera. i still remember those you know so when my mother told us that she had become Muslim, when she came up to San Francisco when we were living with our father, um, we were kind of shocked, horrified, didn't know how to react, um, angry, all kinds of different reactions because it's, it's as if, um, you know, she said, I'm going to go live on Mars or something weird. Like, you, 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 there's no, um, you have nothing in your brain that would um, give you like what the appropriate reaction is in that situation. So we just didn't know what to do. So we just were kind of amazed and angry. And, you know, we saw it as a betrayal of us. So as a result of that kind of shock, um, I moved away from, I never stopped believing in God. I wouldn't say that I was agnostic. I still believed in God firmly. But I wasn't so sure that there was any organized religion that was true or correct. I thought all religions were, you know, it's a mistake that a lot of people make. I assumed that all religions were like Christianity, where at some point there was some grain of truth, divine truth that came down. But it had all been corrupted, and um, it was made by people, and they made it just to control people, and they, did, they weren't really interested in pursuing truth. It was just about control and power and those kind of things. So, um, I still did study religion, but I was not very happy with any kind of organized religion. So, um, kind of went into that rebellious teenage phase. Um, like I said, my brother was in the band. I was actually the singer in the band, <laughs> so I was, and I played keyboard. And so we really got into music and and playing music and trying to succeed in that and pursuing that. Um, and for me, um, I'm going to make the story a little shorter. But for me, it was it was. Um, kind of an existential crisis where if somebody would have would have from the outside would have witnessed my life and what was going on um, it would have been seemingly very um, pleasant and nice you know I was in a band we had all different people coming over all the house all the time we were having fun we were in college et cetera, et cetera. but inside I felt very empty very spiritually dead um, you know, I remember at some point um, I was listening to music and I was watching the smoke. Um, I think I was smoking a cigarette or something, and I was watching the smoke, you know, go out of the ashtray. And I was, was that I was thinking, I wish I could just like fade away, just like the smoke. I wish I could just. I I never thought about killing myself, but I just thought I wish somehow I could just disappear. You know, I wouldn't exist anymore because I didn't see existence as I saw it kind of as pointless, because there was no. There was nothing really fulfilling in my life. It was just going through the motions and going through these exercises, series of exercises that didn't really result in any kind of um, spiritual nourishment at all. So, and I was always looking for that. And I just wasn't finding, I found it, my life just very unsatisfying. So my brother came um, he, you know, to the session, right, where we were supposed to do our recording session. And of course, I never talked to the person he said. So I was thinking, okay, finally, we're going to do it. So I was really excited about it. And suddenly he unplugs his guitar, throws it, you know, walks away. And I was just like, what is going on? And I was the leader of the band. So I was even more angry than anybody. I was the one who was really yelling and saying, you know, what are you doing? We've been, we've been preparing for this literally for years. We have like this guy's ready to give us money for a recording contract and all this other stuff. So what's wrong with you? So he told everybody. And it was amazing. Like, I wish I would have recorded it because he was sitting there perfectly calm, composed, explaining I've become Muslim and here's why. And, 
And I was just like, I wanted to punch him. I mean, I, I people lit, I mean, people had to hold me, but I mean, I literally was, I mean, and I'm not a violent person, but I was extremely violently angry. And I said, what are you talking about? How could you, you know, whatever. So I said, I'm going to prove to him that this is wrong. I mean, my, my whole thing was, I mean, when I get angry, I get angry, but then I get calm and I'm like, okay, you want to become Muslim? I'm going to prove you that the Buddha is wrong. So I remember um, I'd read, my mom had given me like books about Islam, whatever, and I never really read, I mean, I read like some books of Hadith and I never really took it seriously though. I said, I'm not doing anything else. I'm calling off of work. I'm going to stop the ban. I'm going to do everything. And I said, I'm going to read the Quran cover to cover. And I'm, and I'm sure, because I'd done this with the Bible before, I'm sure I will find contradictions. I'm sure I will find a way to disprove it. But what I said, and the key to this all was, and I don't know where this inspiration came from, but I said, if I'm going to do this, what I have to do first is I have to have a very clear mind when I do this. So I stopped whatever I was doing that you can probably imagine that, you know, chemical things. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to stop all, all, anything that would alter my judgment or my reason. And I'm just going to sit here as long as it takes. And I'm going to read the Quran. And I was determined to do this. And really, subhanAllah, what's amazing is, so while he was introduced to Islam and he became Muslim because of this conversation, I, be, I feel like what introduced me to Islam was literally the Quran. And of course, in English, I couldn't read Arabic, didn't understand any, anything about Arabic. Then. So it was the use of Ali, you know, English version of the Quran. But as I started reading it cover to cover, because you have to understand, too, the Bible, no one reads it cover to cover. They just quote certain verses, that, and then they give all kinds of pop psychology from Oprah Winfrey and this person and whatever. And that. So nobody ever is just reading the Bible like they do the Quran. So I said, you know, I definitely... But subhanAllah from the first Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. I mean, as I was going through it, I was just like, I felt like I was going to fall on the floor just from, I said, all of the things that I found in the Bible that I knew were not true. It's like, here's the Quran coming and correcting it and, and, and even explaining more. I mean, more than I could have ever imagined would be in a book was in that book. It was as if, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if God was reading my thoughts and telling me, okay, you've been thinking all this. Okay, I'm going to give you the answers right here. Here's all the answers you've been searching for. Here you go. One, two, three. And subhanAllah, and, and I remember for about a week, I didn't do anything else. I didn't go to work. I didn't go to school. All I did was just read the Quran. And by the end of that time, I mean, I just said, this has to be the truth. I mean, there's no human being could write a book like this. It's impossible. No, no person could have ever come up with this. It has to be from God. It's too comprehensive. It's too amazing. It's too, it speaks directly to your heart in a way that nothing else does. Nothing else could, you know. After I had pretty much, I mean, in my heart, I knew that I was going to become Muslim. But I said, I have to do my due diligence. Um, I, I don't want to just have this be an emotional reaction because I was very emotional and I was like, I don't want this just to be an emotional reaction. So I need to um, make sure I understand what I'm doing. And I, so I went and I talked to the person that he talked to. Um, but I was already much further along in the process than he was. So it wasn't really, I wasn't, at, you know, I wasn't going there for him to convince me because I already was convinced it was just okay, so what about this and what about, and I just had a lot of questions. So what about, I heard this and is this true and whatever. So it wasn't like till four in the morning. I mean, there was a series of things and he already knew my brother. So by the end of that, um, you know, I knew that I, I had become Muslim and it's, you know, it's, it's a process. I mean, the, it's almost like you, you can see your ultimate destination at that point, but you're not there yet. I mean, you still have a lot of work to do. You know, it's a, it's a process you have to go through, but I mean, that was the point where I realized, yeah, I'm going to be Muslim and this is the right religion. And, you know, it was, it was the, through that experience, you know, and then obviously I gave up music. Same thing with him. I just didn't, all the things, and that's what I was telling you about. Sometimes I wish some, you know, that I had a recorder, I could go back there and remember what it was like because so many of the things that were so appealing to me before, they, they have no, they don't appeal to me at all anymore. You know, I, I mean, I, I work 
in a company where I'm around non-Muslims and I get invited all the time, oh, why don't you come with us to the bar? Why don't you come um, go to the restaurant with us and you know drink whatever? And even when I see people doing that, it just makes me sick and I feel sorry for those people. I don't feel like it's something even if even if I was allowed to do it, it doesn't appeal to me anymore. You know, playing music and going to concerts and going to clubs and all this other stuff. It just I mean, immediately, what immediately happened was all of the fascination and the appeal of those activities just like faded away. I didn't, I didn't have any interest in that anymore. I mean, I had an interest in developing a relationship with God, with learning about the religion, and I spent years and years and years reading books and learning about it, and you know. So, but, but that's the that was what you know that was like the genesis of the whole thing was that experience. It's, it's strange how, at least for me, and my brother kind of said this too, for me when I recognized the truth, I had no choice but to follow it. I, I couldn't, like right now, I mean even at that point, and I feel the same way today, even if I wanted to not follow Islam, I couldn't. Like I could pretend like I didn't believe in it. Like if somebody said, I'm going to chop your head off unless you say you don't believe in Islam, of course I could say that, but nowhere in my heart is that true, and in no way for any reward or any... Um, whatever benefit, because we've suffered a lot being Muslim. You know, we, we have gone through a lot of difficult times. Um, we were rejected by our family, we were rejected by our friends, by our peers, I've lost jobs because of it, I've lost a lot of friends because of it, etc. So we did go through a lot of hardship, but at no time did I feel like I had a choice to follow Islam or not. It w that was never a question, because when I recognized the truth, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't. It's as clear as the sun in the sky. So no matter how much you don't want to believe the sun exists, it's still going to be there when you wake up in the morning, regardless. So what are you going to do? You just have to accept it. So I mean, I, I, yes, I had the ego. And yes, I did think um, at some point um, I, I considered my options, but it really wasn't an option for me to not follow. It was just a question of, you know, when your friends ask you, you know, well, how come you don't want to go drinking with them? What are you going to say? And, you know, when you when people say this, what are you going to do? And, you know, in this situation, so you know, there's a lot of image management, and I guess that's ego to a certain extent because you you don't want to be seen as the outsider, as the weird person, as the whatever. But it was never a question of whether I believe in it or whether I'm going to follow it. It's really, I mean, the the surah I think about the most is Surah Ali Imran because it talks about the real story of Jesus. So for me, all of the things in that surah are things that I thought probably had to have been true even before I read the Quran. So the story that I, the, the, the image of Jesus that I had in my mind and the stories that I thought of this is probably how it happened, even though nobody told me that, I found all of those stories in that surah. So I said, well there must be something to what I was thinking because here it is. I mean, and, and it makes sense. You know, it can't be uh, so that was the main, that was probably the first one that affected me. But of course, you know, as you go through the process, you change as a person, so nothing is static. So the, the parts of the Quran that I, appealed to me most when I first became Muslim are not the same ones that appeal the most to me now because I'm a different person. Not the Quran's not different, I'm different. <laughs> so, but in, in the beginning, yes, that was the sort of it. Just when, when it talks about the story of, of, uh, of Sayyidina Maryam Islam and how the birth of, of Nabi Isa Islam and how uh, especially the part that says, um, uh, you know, God has made me kind to my mother and has made me, uh, there's, and blessings on me the day that I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I will be, you know, raised up again. And the way that Nabi Isa Islam talked to his mother and the way, because in Christianity it's a very weird thing about, you, you have this story in, in, in one of the Gospels with the Feast of Canaan where he says to his mother, woman, go away from me. And you think a prophet, you know, somebody like Jesus would never talk to his mother like that. And the beautiful examples you have, I mean, it's throughout the Quran, but especially in that story of the relationship between uh, Sayyidina Maryam Islam and Nabi Isa Islam and, and the way that that relationship is explained, it's a beautiful picture of what you would imagine a prophet would be like. And so many, they call it a surah in the Quran as a picture. So when you read those surahs, you get a mental picture of what the prophet was like. You almost to the point you can see him, and that, those were the most amazing parts because the image that I that it had in the Quran was fit with the image in my mind that I always had. It's always temporary, you know. You you, um, well, the one interesting story was you know our one of the guys that was in the band with us. His name was Mike. Um, 
he initially, when we obviously both of us became Muslim, the band broke up. So um, for a long time, we lost him as a friend because, you know, whatever. And he was Catholic. But then actually over time, we actually kind of reconnected and he eventually became Muslim. So, and I think it had to do with our, and he's actually still Muslim, married to a Muslim woman. He has kids, whatever. So um, there are stories like that. But of course, there's also lots of stories of, um, you know, our grandparents for many, many years, you know, we had no relationship with them. And then eventually we did reconcile, but it was painful. I mean, and it was very awkward and it was very, um, very uncomfortable. You know, we would go to the, the family gatherings and, you know, in Islam, you can't break off relations with your family. So we, Islam tells you that you have to keep that relationship, but it's not easy when people, you know, you, they grew up and saw you a certain way and then now you're a different person and it's, it's just painful, you know, difficult. I've, I've, I, lo I, you know, I work for, I'm not going to say what company, but I work for a large company um, before 9-11. You, you know, now I'm pretty much doing Turkiya at work. <laughs> before 9-11, I was pretty open about the fact that I was Muslim and, you know, I, people told me that, you know, you're never going to go anywhere in this company because you're Muslim. And they eventually fired me. They found an excuse to fire me. So, I mean, you know, you, you know, you, those kind of things happen. Um, but, of course, those things are nothing compared with the joy that you get from being a Muslim and living as a Muslim and um, progressing spiritually. I mean, if you... Uh, you know, the person that's found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's found Islam, whatever else he lost because of that is nothing. You know, it doesn't, it's inconsequential. And the people who have everything but they don't have Islam, what do they have? So no matter what you lose, you know, you're not losing anything of value, but we've, I've lost, we've lost things. I married my wife, we've been married for 13 years, alhamdulillah, to a woman, south, a woman Lebanese from the south, south of Lebanon, and uh, we have, I have three kids, Zainab Ali and Mahdi, so, you know, we've, yeah, we've, uh, and, and uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to marry somebody who was Muslim, who was Shia, um, and, uh, you know, like any marriage, any relationship, there's ups and downs, but alhamdulillah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, and it's, it's based on how Islam teaches you to treat your wife and how Islam teaches her to treat her husband. I mean, so you, you, you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah. My brother moved to Dearborn in 2000 because for, for, for a job, and I, um, uh, my mom moved here after him, um, and then my sister moved here, and like usual, I was the last one to move here, and I went back and forth, and I, ha I w was working in California for a while, then I came back here. So it's just, it's a nice community because, especially for my wife and for my daughter, they both wear the hijab. So living here, you, you feel that you're part of a Muslim community, even though obviously it's not perfect. Um, and when my wife and my daughter go out in public, you know, nobody looks at them weird or harasses them or anything. So it's, it's more comfortable. We live in a predominantly Muslim area. So you, you just, you feel, you feel more yourself. You feel more comfortable being yourself. And, you know, then you don't have to always hide your identity. And it's natural that if someone is Iraqi, their parents would want them to marry somebody who's like them. There's nothing wrong with that. In Islam, it didn't come to eliminate culture. It just came to perfect it. It came to make it better. So we as Americans, especially white Americans, we, it is more difficult for us because we don't have a lot of um, potential spouses to choose from. You know, there are other revert um, Anglo-American women who are converts that I was introduced to. It just didn't click. Um, uh, People are people, and uh, you know, I understand why Pakistanis want them, their kids to marry Pakistanis. Iraqis want them. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have any objection to that. But um, and it wasn't easy for me to find my wife, and I had to, uh, you know, use my skills and my, <laughs> and I had to be go through uncomfortable situations and things. I mean, you, you, that's part of life. You know, don't, don't be. I'm sorry. Don't be a wimp. I mean, you, you. If you've chosen a religion, it's much more difficult to become a Muslim and to reject your whole society and everything else than it is to find a spouse from a different culture. It's not easy, 
But you know, you can do it. Just just get a little bit of courage and 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 just keep working at it. And it's not that hard. And I'm sorry, this is kind of a sore subject because like him, I used to go on Shia Chat. And one of the reasons I stopped going on Shia Chat is because every person, I was a moderator for a while, and every person that would would be about this subject. They would say, oh brother, I'm having such a hard time getting married. Can you please help me? I'm a reaver. And I'm just thinking to myself, it's really not that hard. I don't know why you guys are having such a hard time with it. You just, it's like anything else. It's not easy to get a college degree. It's not easy to find a job. It's not easy to buy a house. A lot of things in life are hard. You just have to keep working at it. You know, so if you're having a hard time, I can give you my advice. I can tell you what I did. It's not necessarily going to work for you because every person's different. Every situation's different. I'll try to help, but have faith in God. Say dua. Um, try to be a better person, you know, because if you're, if you want to attract somebody, you have to be attractive. I don't mean physically attractive. I mean, you have to perfect your amen. You have to, um, you know, be able to exist in the society as a person of substance, as a person who's, uh, who's knowledgeable. If you do that, you're going to find people are going to be attracted to you, all different kinds of people. So try to make yourself that kind of person. You know, don't just complain about, oh, I can't find a spouse. Reverts, they complain a lot. I'm sorry, some of them. So, and I have some sympathy for them. But, you know, when, when I became a Muslim and we became Muslim in the, in the 1980s, I'm sorry, there was no internet. If we wanted to get a book about Islam, we actually had to go find a bookstore, go to a book table, and buy an actual book and read it and spend our own money to buy it. And we had to go f seek people out and find people who were... We didn't have the internet. We couldn't just go and do a Google search and find it. It was difficult. We really had to put forth a lot of effort to, be, to learn about Islam. So well, people today, it's much easier. There's a lot more information available. It's easy to find things out. You know, and I make the same, I would say the same thing about Americans who don't know about Islam, who are missing the wonderful opportunity to learn about Islam and become Muslim. That's your fault because there's plenty of information available. Challenge yourself. Try to grow and progress as a person intellectually. Don't be satisfied with your situation. Don't be satisfied just with working, going to your job nine to five, coming home, sleeping, going to the bar, going to the disco, spending all your money. I mean, don't, don't be satisfied with that life. That's not life. That's not living. Don't, you know, so, so, so make yourself feel uncomfortable sometimes. Do things that you're not sure about. Make mistakes. You know, look, ask questions that you think people are going to like. I mean, put yourself out there, you know. So I just... Um, Yes, it's true that um, sometimes um, I've had reverts tell me that, well, I went to the mosque and the people, they were nice and everything, but they seemed kind of uncomfortable because whatever. Well, yeah, if you're sitting in the room and an elephant walks in, you're going to think it's kind of strange. I mean, there's not, most, most mosques, um, unfortunately, are predominated by one particular group. You have the Iraqi mosque, you have the Lebanese mosque, you have whatever. So somebody who's not from that culture when they come in, I mean, people are not going to be mean to you. I mean, I never had an experience in a mosque where anybody was mean to me. But yes, it's going to be, you're going to be the unusual person. Fine, okay, but, but take that as an opportunity to grow as a person, to grow spiritually. Don't see it as a barrier, you know. And I don't think everybody should be accommodated in every request they have because it makes you weaker to some extent. Be, try to become a strong person rather than asking everybody to roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> you know, the, the early Muslims didn't have it easy. They had it much harder than we did. They suffered much more than we did. Am, am I going to compare myself to Imam Hussein Ali Islam? No, of course not. So, I mean, you're not going to have to go through that. You're not going to go through close to that. So, you know, man up. Well, there's, there's two parts to that question. You asked, are there triggers? And then could I be a trigger? Yes, I could be a trigger. But I think I, it's not necessary for me to be a trigger. There's plenty of other triggers. When the Boston Marathon bombing happened, the tragic, horrible event, and these crazy idiots who did this, um, people should say, is this what Islam is? They say these people are Muslim. So where in Islam does it tell people that they should find out about it? This is a trigger for you. you should, it should trigger you to think. I mean, it's a horrible, tragic event. What happened in London when the person was beheaded? What happened in, on, well, I don't want to go into 9-11, but what happened with um, lots of, there's lots of triggers, you know. Um, people are, you're confronted constantly in your life with things that don't fit the narrative that you've constructed in your own head about reality. That's constantly happening to everybody. 
most people choose to instead of investigating it, instead of looking into it, and I'm sorry, I've always done that. I'm not bragging about myself, but I've made a lot of mistakes and done a lot of wrong things too, but I've never been afraid to question my beliefs and to question my what I believed about the world. And so if people don't do that, it's a choice. You know, there are triggers. There are things all the time that should make you question. You know, how could I be a trigger? Um, I mean, like my brother, I've been involved in numerous different activities. I'm not currently involved in anything actively right now. But since I've been a Muslim, I mean, I, I, it's hard to even remember how many different projects I've been involved in. Um, we try, we've tried to start Islamic schools here. Um, I'm, I'm a business person, so I've done business plans, tried to help them with that with their financials, and I've done um, different things like that, acted as a consultant, and I've done, I've written plays before and had plays produced. Um, I had a play produced about Imam Hussein al Islam and other things. So, I mean, I've written a book also. And it's basically about the concept of the Jihad al Akbar and talking about how that, and, and how that filters through Islam and the theological foundation of that and, and how that, basically talking about that through the lens of American culture and whatever. But I mean, it's still a work in progress. It's whatever. But I, I'm not here to promote myself. Because there's many pe much pe people that are much more knowledgeable than me that should be on TV, that should be talking, that, that are much smarter than me. But I could be a trigger and I could contribute in some small way. Um, inshallah, I can to this. But it's not necessary for me to do that. You know, I mean, there's, like I said, there's, there's people have lots of opportunities. The most important thing is the purity of your intention and of your niyyah. It all starts with that. Like my brother said, when he became a Muslim, he sincerely asked God, guide me. I want to be guided, guide me. I don't know what's going to happen after this. I don't know what God's going to say, what he's going to require of me, what he wants me to do, but I don't care. I want to be guided. I'm sincerely asking for guidance. That's all you need to do. You don't need to be a college graduate. You don't need to have no, learn Arabic. You don't need any of that. All you need is to be sincere, to have ikhlas, to have purity of faith, and to have a sincere niya, have a, a, an intention that's pure and sincere between you and God. Forget what everybody else thinks. So I, I don't know why it's so hard for people. To, I, it's hard for me to, you know, well, I swear. I feel like um, sometimes that, um, you know, I haven't progressed enough in my spirituality. I feel like I've made a lot of effort since I've become Muslim, but there's still, I, I find all kinds of things I could be doing too, more myself, um, to progress spiritually. I mean, you look at someone, I mean, they've all mentioned this, you look at someone like Imam Ali Islam, you look at someone like uh, Imam Hassan Islam, Imam Hussein, the Imams, don't forget about them. Look at someone like Baglul, look at someone like Salman al Farsi, look at someone like Mukhtar, look at someone like Imam Khomeini. Imam, there's so many examples of people that have so far surpassed us in their faith that we feel ashamed even to call ourselves Muslims if they're Muslim, right? So why haven't I gotten to that level? I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. Maybe I'm not sincere enough. Could be. But, so I'm not the person to give advice to other people because honestly, it, I'm not, I'm not a, a anywhere close to those people. I, I, if I learned anything, if I have any... Uh, good things about my personality, it's from the dust of the feet of Imam Hussein I mean, sincerely. I mean, I'd, I'm not worthy even to kiss his feet, you know, myself. But people can, wherever, however far down you are, you can always move up. There's always a way to move up. God will always provide you with some kind of path to move up. And the key to that is being sincere. The key to that is being honest with yourself honest before God, being sincere, having a good intention. That's the key. If you do that, you don't need the internet. You don't even need books. There's people that have progressed spiritually with not even knowing how to read. One of the things that I remember that my brother, actually my brother and this friend told me about how he became Muslim is, and it stuck with me, that when he, when he told him that, you know, you can have monkeys throwing letters all day long, and they'll never spell the Constitution. Just like you can have random genetic mutations forever, for all of eternity, they'll never result in a single cell. They'll never result in blue-green algae. Evolution will never happen. It's mathematically impossible, right? So you know this, so why don't you admit this? You know that that's true. Why don't you admit it? And my brother said, well, 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 and his friend told him, he said, because you're a coward. 
That's why, because you're a coward. And when something about when he said that, he said, my brother's face turned red and he got mad. What, you're calling me a coward? Who are you? I don't even, I just met you five minutes ago. You're calling. But it's true. I mean, anybody who, who rejects something they know, people, people uh, tie themselves up in knots in their brain all the time like that because they know something's true, but they're too much of a coward. I've met people so many times in my life who've told me, you know, I know Islam is right and, and I agree with you and it's a beautiful religion, but I can't stop drinking. I love alcohol. You know, people came up to the, to the, the Prophet Muhammad Islam, and they said, you know, we love your religion, but you, can you just delete prayer? Can you just delete sujood? And the Prophet would say, well, it's not up to me. It's not my religion. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't change anything, you know. So, but people, that's what they want. You know, so and, and if, if 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 it's so a lot of what stops people from progressing spiritually is they're they're a coward. And that's what stopped him. And when somebody called him a coward to his face and he realized it, something changed inside of him, you know. So don't be afraid to, to be honest with people. You know? I tried it, but usually it doesn't work very well. But sometimes. <laughs>